Dette er den ukentlige nyhetssendingen fra Europa. Every day they used to business sitting there for magic potions destroying me friends stealing his wall No that was uh that was interesting stuff there that was uh Herve Courtois uh, second appearance on European News Weekly, and uh, if you're listening to this, Herf, thanks very, very much. That was uh, that was pretty interesting interview, Sean. Yeah, and very topical. We yeah. did cover a lot of different things um, uh, to do with that, um, and um, I think you had a question about fish or something uh, come to you on the on the the notice board there. Indeed, yeah, yeah, that that came in from uh, Chris in the chat box there, and. Uh, it's it's quite a topical question as well too. Is sure. it safe to eat fish? Um, well, it's, it's one a one of the things. Question. It's because there's so many there's so many problems with contamination of the ocean. It's not just nuclear. There's there's the dumping of raw sewage. There's the dumping of all sorts of type of petrochem waste. Uh, basically, the oceans are a dumping ground basically for for human beings. As far yeah. that, you know, so it's questionable whether any ocean is really safe and free from contaminations, and it, it's it's a huge topic. It's it's massive, you know. So, so. and as as we're looking at uh, larger fish die-offs and what have you than we would normally expect in, on an annual average, uh, and uh, certainly uh, we're looking at some stocks appearing to be incredibly low. Um, uh, what we're what we're really seeing at some point in the future is not a question of is it safe to eat the fish? It would be more a question of should we be eating fish at all because we need them to uh, reproduce and re re uh, restock the oceans. Uh, but uh, while we look at, uh, you know, like the Gulf of Mexico in the Atlantic uh, side of it, uh, we're looking at uh, massive amounts of uh, algae bloom, uh, mainly because of farm runoff. Uh, we're looking at Corexit, that's uh, an, an oil that's uh, coming out of the oil, re oil rigs that are down there. Uh, we've covered that with Charles Williams Diggs on an earlier podcast. Uh, we have looked at uh, Fukushima um, and the contamination uh, that's happening there, how that's affecting the fish stocks in the uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, we're looking at uh, sort of quite uh, dramatic uh, uh, temperature changes in different parts of the uh, world with the seas. Uh, we're seeing that's having an effect on breeding and various other things. Uh, yeah, we're seeing uh, the uh, growth of uh, uh, jellyfish as a replacement to the uh, uh, the mammalian fish that we are uh, used to seeing in our uh, seas. So, uh, with the pollution of mercury and uh, radiation and uh, plastic and all the other things that we're putting in, we're certainly looking at large swathes of the uh, oceans uh, being. Uh, you know, sort of uh, unsuitable uh, for farming. I, sure. I think uh, the whole idea of uh, not fishing, so to get... <laughs> <What's... laughs> All right. Uh, the whole idea of um, restocking the fish and the fish populations and not fishing to give them a chance, I think it's all fairly mute unless we sort of tackle the problem of the pollution of the oceans first and, and restore their habitat back to them and then maybe uh, they might stand a chance of recuperating, but I think in the, I think in the modern time with the modern dumping that's going on, and uh, over the last uh, sixty years or so, uh, I think it's it's just a cocktail of disaster out there in the oceans, and it's probably best don't eat fish for a long, long time. Well, while we're going for agrochemical sort of corporations, uh, you know, uh, and their power, uh, we've got an uphill struggle ahead of us. Uh, I thought I might just mention two quick stories. Uh, there's a major lawsuit against Monsanto, completely blacked out by the media. And if you go to the antimedia.org, you can catch that story. And another story about Monsanto. Monsanto and others caught paying internet trolls to attack activists. <laughs> hmm. Well, anyway, that's uh, from authenticenlightenment.com. Worth having a look at that post, because... Uh, uh, 
we, we enjoy uh, the tracking down of, uh, of uh, sort of uh, corporate uh, trolls, you know, and uh, we're getting quite good at it, actually. I think, uh, aren't we, Jimmy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do our best anyway. We do our bit. <laughs> but uh, pop over there for an enlightening uh, little uh, look-see at uh, what Monsanto's been up to. And bear in mind that Shell and BP and uh, Tepco have uh, also used these uh, corporations to uh, uh, basically send people into uh, forums and uh, columns and comment sections to uh, basically break up and... Uh, and uh, you know, sort of show, uh, uh, sort of break down the the dialogue that that would be happening otherwise. Um, so we've seen a lot of that. Yeah, I've got a little one coming out of Norway. I know, I know, we should be in the Irish hour, but uh, we are having a, a little bit of a, a sciencey sort of a day anyway. And uh, I was just noticing uh, something about Statoil and uh, the Norwegian state-owned petroleum company. And it's, uh, it, it lets go of all its shame, apparently, and uh, puts climate future uh, and Norway's reputation at risk. Now, it's uh, coming July 30th from uh, your Bologna. Dot, uh, Bologna yeah. So, uh, Vice President, uh, Chief Economist of Norway's state-owned petroleum company, Statoil, Mr. Eric Warnes uh, left all shame behind in a debate with MEP Katrin van Bremt and, uh, and European Commissioner Director General of Climate Action Jos uh, Delbique. Uh, when asked by journalist Sonja van Ransen to describe a world in which global warming is limited to 2 degrees Celsius, Warnes took the opportunity to suggest that petroleum demand will remain stable and that it would be a huge challenge to deliver enough oil and gas in the two degree scenario, okay? So I know we've been discussing this two degree scenario for for, for a couple of months now, especially with our old Kevin Hester. So, um, sure. And all the uh, research seems to say that like, uh, if we let go as far as two degrees, it will be too late already. So, And it's uh, it even seems to be on uh, an exponential sort of uh, escalation just at the minute. <clears throat> now, I think... Uh, so as we talk about Statol, it kind of brings us into the Irish section because uh, obviously the Shell to Sea went uh, to Statol to have a talk to them about um, how to, you know, privatise uh, your own resources. Um, and uh, but yeah, Statol have definitely uh, stepped out of the mark. We might bear in mind that Norwegian insurance company, uh, a large insurance corporation, turned around and uh, divested of coal. So uh, Norway is certainly on the uh, on on the right one, but I would have thought that Statoil is uh, treading on uh, eggshells at the moment in Norway, <laughs> uh, as the people are uh, kind of becoming more aware because they are very travelled people, becoming more aware of the effects of uh, global warming on various parts of the world. Now, and also since we were chatting there about uh, radioactivity in Fukushima and stuff, there's a dispute in Spain now just at the minute. Uh, over where to put radioactive trash. Now, this was coming out of Nuclear News, uh, an article by Christina McPherson. Now, Spain's Conservative government and general region of Castilla La Mancha uh, locked horns Thursday over plans to build the nation's first ever temporary storage facility for highly radioactive waste. Uh, the country's Nuclear Security Council on Monday approved a report that gives the green light for the facility to be built near the village of. Villar de Canas in Castilla La Mancha. Now, um, so obviously, like, uh, we could be seeing this here too in Ireland because we were chatting about this with, uh, was it, who was it we were chatting? Wayne, Wayne Jones. Wayne, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right, about uh, this new enactment or this, this new legislation or this new uh, proposal that, uh, like, um, countries can take in radioactive waste from other countries uh, and, and get paid to do so. So, um, it's, a, it's an EU directive basically that mm. says that everybody, all, all member countries have to have uh, a disposal for nuclear waste as part of their uh, uh, as part of their plan and that's going to cost money so Ireland which doesn't have a hell of a lot of nuclear waste also has to do it but uh, one has to wonder it's, it's basically to do with the fact that in Ireland, uh, anybody could turn around and say, well, I, I'm going to give my land over to nuclear dumping, and they could come in with the drills and drill down and stick a, stick a lump of radiation down there and uh, walk away. Um, and the, uh, you know, the, the landowner could make a pe pretty penny. Um, but obviously, uh, for generations ahead, it may 
may uh, backfire a little bit as uh, Chris Busby was looking at that type of storage and uh, there was a bit of a problem about what happened to the gases and the other uh, elements that these, uh, these uh, isotopes or these radioactive materials turn into over time. They change, uh, they change their nature and uh, the storage uh, is, doesn't necessarily take that into account. I guess it's only a matter of time before we see legislation enacted where it will be a requirement that everybody sort of like intake the recommended daily allowance of radionuclides. What do you reckon? I, I think uh, the way that Sellafield is going, I think we'll have to do that anyway. We're not doing it anyway. <laughs> we're already getting a recommended daily allowance. <laughs> we're, getting a, we're getting a bit of a dose, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, with the fish thing, uh, one might bear in mind that, uh, in, uh, as, as uh, Herb pointed out, that the fish uh, was being sold in the national market in Japan, but uh, it could also make the international market, uh, and it wouldn't have a, a, a Fukushima uh, sort of um, uh, signature to it. So that being the case, it would not be checked by, say, the UK, for instance, uh, as the uh, produce came into the UK and could be sold on. So, um, you know, I'd be a bit wary about Pacific uh, fish, uh, going back to that story. Um, that could end up on uh, on uh, our tables, you know, in cans that we, uh, we buy. Well, indeed, and, indeed. Because, um, I mean, yeah. like most of the time it'll say, oh, it's been uh, packaged in such and such a country, but that's about as much information as you might get on some of these cans. And, and this, uh, I've looked into it, it's a slippery slope. Uh, the South Koreans go to the Japan Sea to fish. They then go back, uh, and it would be a Canadian company that would actually own that. Uh, uh, but uh, obviously the, the, the boats would probably be Korean. Uh, and, uh, and then basically it would go through, say, Canada, because there's an agreement like, like TPP called NAFTA, uh, which, uh, which they are using to... Uh, to move this uh, contaminated produce around and, and mix it down as well. So, you know, if you're buying mixed fish products or mixed anything, rice or whatever, it could have bits of Fukushima in it. And uh, it's very hard to uh, tell what's happening. We certainly saw in uh, Taiwan there was uh, an issue about Fukushima produce being relabeled. So even if Fukushima produce is labeled, it doesn't mean that it can't be relabeled. Um, and a few people got caught out for doing that in Taiwan, mm -hmm. uh, and I think Hong Kong as well, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you do remember correct. There's been a few stories over the last couple of months of of, of uh, goods being intercepted at customs places, and uh, it, it's not what it's uh, it, it's not coming where, from where it was written on on the label. So, yeah, I think this is uh, this is in everybody's future now, coming to a store near you. And of course, talking about Monsanto and GMO uh, products uh, in America, they've just said that they don't have to sort of say if there's GMO products on the label. Uh, and that's just a step away from getting rid of uh, uh, origin source data altogether. And you can imagine that T, uh, TPP and TIPP would uh, definitely be calling uh, on that one. So. I found it very, Sorry. very interesting as well, too. Before we leave the radiation subject now, uh, because her. Uh, made a, a curious correlation to a story that was relayed to us last week from our John Doe and uh, yeah. in relation to the peer pressure of kids at the schools to to eat the uh, contaminated foods uh, despite what their parents uh, wishes may be. Now I just thought it quite interesting that we got a, another confirmation of that story from a second source so that's uh, and uh, indeed, Herb has been doing this for some time, so his sources uh, will, you know, he'll be looking at two to three sources uh, to get that confirmation um, of, of a story that's, that is plausible. Um, and uh, so, uh, and obviously, as you're saying, that they have, uh, they have similar sources, actually, the pair of them, and, and also differing sources as well that they look at. So, and uh, yeah, we're, it's just good to get this confirmation, and uh, you know, over we'll, we'll be looking at this as a topic because it's just uh, you can apply it to any major disaster or any major cover-up, uh, whether it's a referendum or a, an oil disaster or a gas disaster. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking at uh, the issues there. So, um, yeah, right, okay. And there was a story while we're if we're on the Irish one and uh, just loosely uh, looking at contaminated water supplies. Uh, we'll be looking at the fact that uh, 
there's been a study out that says that uh, fracking water has been used on Californian produce. And of course, a lot of that Californian produce comes over here. Uh, well, this morning I was talking with someone who was thinking, well, you know, maybe it's not that bad. Um, and uh, I just very quickly showed him how bad the uh, water situation is in, uh, in uh, sort of California. Uh, in fact, uh, I even pointed out to him that, uh, you know, in Canada they're trying to destroy lots of uh, beautiful uh, land to, to build a series of dams to bring water into the U.S., you know. Um, so this is the kind of desperation, the l large geoengineering projects that, that are not environmentally, uh, environmentally friendly uh, being used to overcome other environmentally friendly practices that have caused problems. So uh, we're, we're just seeing one thing being heaped on top of another with big industry as opposed to looking to small local solutions. You know. Well, there is a general trend going on here, and it's, it's centering around water because um, as we've been, I think the very, very first water story we ever covered, I think, was the Sao Paulo um, water uh, shortage that was going on down there. We got a report there a couple of weeks ago about people trying to, to get water out of sludge and mud so that's how desperate things probably are going to get in those regions so it's not surprising really that they're recycling fracking water uh, it's not <laughs> it doesn't surprise me at all but i said beware your oranges and to beware your fruits and and things like that and uh, just yeah just be you know we, we do not know where our food is coming from basically well you can say that most of your almonds come from california put it that way right right they, they take up quite nice contaminants. I mean, they're not that particularly healthy anyway, I believe, for various other reasons. But, okay. Uh, but, yeah, but uh, almonds. And almonds are very water-intensive. Um, there's other things that they grow there as well that are very water-intensive. So it's good to, uh, to finish that. But, um, so, but the, right. the type of things, though, that we're getting that you can get out of radioactive uh, waste from fracking material, like, I mean, it's, it's radioactive, isn't it, in certain respects? You've got petro yeah. petrochemicals. I mean, the argument is that it would only be 1 or 2% would be crystals and impurities like iron, and they very rarely mention the word uranium or thorium. <laughs> but, but the point is that we're, we're saying at the end of the day, if you're spraying things like thorium, uranium, or any other nasty... I think there's 100 chemicals and there's about 20 or 30 percent of them, maybe a bit more, uh, which are uh, very concerning, according to a report that came out uh, the last week or so that it's reported on. So, uh, so that's that. Mm, that um, is, yes. I, I would have thought, um, if we come away from the Irish water thing, which we, we, I think you've got some stories about that to come into, haven't you? Um, about which, no. Uh, Irish water or... Oh, I've got uh, very little about Irish water. You know, I think I'm Irish watered out, you know, to be honest. <laughs> so it's sort of uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think the latest is the uh, Irish water are uh, a sinking ship, basically, and uh, they have to remain on the Irish books, so the... Sinking ship heading to a watery grave. <laughs> honest to God. <laughs> but anyway, look, that's about as much as I care about Irish water this week. I think more importantly, I think more importantly, uh, we had a, a councillor, an MP. Uh, well, let's see, we, Ireland will decriminalise cannabis now. Apparently, apparently. So. Oh, before you do that one, can I just do a quick shout out? 29th of August, the Dull Dublin massive water protest. Um, you know, we don't want to sort of think we've won the game because the EU is coming back saying that we need to privatise. We need to send a message to the EU uh, on the 29th of this month, August, uh, outside the Dáil, in Dublin, we need to be sending a clear message to the EU that our Irish water, our resources, should stay for Ireland, uh, in much the same way that Norway's resources are for Norway, and uh, other resources for other countries are for them as well. Um, that's that's just my uh, my penny's worth, uh, uh, just in case we, we, we're... We, uh, Irish water isn't on the downward uh, spiral, it should be by then. Okay, so... And uh, let's hope that they don't send any of their radioactive waste over here for us to bury because uh, I don't want any of our lovely, well, fluoridated water contaminated with radioactive waste. So uh, <laughs> keep, your, yeah. keep your rubbish as well. <laughs> I'll just and a big heads up to Aaron Brockovich uh, for busting some of the interesting stories coming up about um, the, uh, the fluoridated water issue as well as other water issues. She's been covering quite a lot. And if you want to know about Irish water, um, I would say call for a revolution in Ireland. 
uh, which is on Facebook. If you go there, Bellinus has been posting and keeping an eye on things and uh, a very critical eye, and he's been doing a good job. Uh, there's also one other story I just thought I'd quickly mention um, while I had it here, and that is basically uh, uh, Konstantin Gurdjieff, uh, who has basically uh, put out a story um, and... Let me just, oh, heaven's sake, what's happened there? It's gone. Uh, all right, he put out a story, and he's, he's basically, if you pop over to his blog, he, he basically is saying that uh, the competition and innovation in Ireland is really only for the corporations. Uh, they're the ones that seem to be getting all the breaks, the tax breaks and what have you, whereas the sort of small self-employed person who, who, who are the real in innovators, he believes, in the society, uh, don't seem to be getting that. They seem to be getting hammered with the taxes to pay uh, the... Uh, sort of big corporations like Starbucks who paid 4,000 uh, uh, euros in tax last year. Um, so basically they they feel that the smaller taxpayers is, are being uh, subsidizing the large ones uh, and it's uh, very uh, uh, not very good for Irish innovation uh, on, the, on the local scale. So uh, that's where, uh, where, where he sees uh, the uh, sort of economy improving if it is going to improve. But he, he has some doubts, and uh, I just found that a very interesting article from him, and well worth a mention to everyone. Right, uh, um, over to you, mate. Um, uh, your next bit. Oh, um, yeah. Well, I suppose he's not sure about what exactly. If we're, we're, uh, about a recovery in the economy, or what, or. Well, it's it's uh, it, it's not so much to, to do with the well. It is to do with the recovery, obviously, because uh, you know what, what he was saying. Basically, um, I'll just get the the story up here, and um, it's just coming up now. I mean, because I've got my popcorn ready, you know, and everything. So this uh, big uh, collapse is happening in September or October. Well, I'm, I'm not know? too sure about that. I've, well, I've got <laughs> anyway, I, I've, I've got me I've got me big cup of coca-cola and a big huge bowl of popcorn ready and I'm going to sit down and watch it happen <laughs> all right okay well I'm, I'm going to do the quote the quote I'm going to right. actually quote his post right. uh, from from his blog um, so uh, or some of it anyway but uh, I mean basically what happened was uh, uh, yeah on January the 27th 2011 our pro-business leader uttered the following I will seek the trust of the Irish people to implement Fianna Gael's plan to get Ireland working again. I firmly believe that by 2016, Ireland can become the best small country in the world in which to do business, and the best country in which to raise a family, and the best country in which to grow old with dignity and respect. Well, that didn't go too well, did it? Let's leave the family and dull dignity bits to the softer side of the coalition and focus on the first promise, uh, squarely relating to economics. On the October 8th, uh, 2011, Mr. Kenny repeated the same said promise uh, since coming into office seven, seven months ago. I have told nearly all audiences that by 2016 I intend to make Ireland the best small country in the world in which to do business. And then again on February 28th, the, dynamic, the dynamo spun again. Uh, those of you from Ireland will have heard me say many times that my ambition is for Ireland to become the best small country in the world for business. By this is a real snapshot by a PR company, isn't it? You can easily tell. So, uh, but there are many things going on here. Uh, Constantine goes on to say, um, perhaps unbeknownst to Mr. Kenny, but one thing is pretty darn clear: Ireland is nowhere near being a half decent place to become an entrepreneur. Why? Uh, and he said to read this. The reality is that we have no incentive tax-wise for Irish entrepreneurs. Uh, and then he links to an independent IE uh, article. And it's authored by the, uh, an entrepreneur and an investor. So those of you who follow my work, he goes on to say, have known for ages that I advocate complete reform of our tax codes in relation to employee share, shared ownership plans and options capital gains taxation, especially linked to subsequent reinvestment of business sale proceeds, self-employment taxation system, and employees, uh, directors, and owners system of reimbursement, with a direct link to their investments in business. Those of you who are entrepreneurs in Ireland know that none, in contrast to Mr. Kenny's assertions, he says, of these and other, he says, key areas of Ireland's competitors have been reformed or improved by the current government. I repeat, none. 
So, I mean, I would go over to trueeconomics.blogspot.com. Uh, he does a little update on the Irish economy as well there, in another uh, post. Uh, but I, I quite like that. And that came out uh, just the 1st of the 8th, 1st of August. So, um, and it, you know, obviously I, I know some people that are self-employed in Ireland and uh, they, are, they are getting hit quite heavily for, uh, for tax, you know. So it's, um, it, it's kind of a big burden when you're struggling, really, and you're charging cheaper pri uh, prices because of the, uh, the state of the economy. Um, so, uh, and uh, obviously uh, the bigger companies are asking uh, for a lesser price, and that comes down to the little subcontracting uh, self-employed person. Um, and uh, I believe Ireland's quite big with this. So, uh, uh, but as we're saying, you know, uh, we're getting uh, sort of uh, big corporations like Starbucks paying four thousand euros. Um, I know some. I know a self-employed person who's just made scraped away for the last year and has uh, has that type of bill. So it's uh, and then of course you have to pay that a year in advance as well. So you know that would be like six thousand pounds to find. You know. Um, so it's uh, it's quite hard that uh, a single hard-working person would be paying more tax than a large corporation like Starbucks. And I believe, according to the article I read, that Starbucks didn't pay any tax for two years previous to that. Uh, but anyway, so uh, where which way is the the uh, the, the pendulum weighed? And it, I, I would say that uh, Constantine has uh, kind of hit the nail on the head there with this and. It kind of makes a lot of sense to me and my my uh, limited knowledge of Ireland, should we say? So, uh, but that's that's that story out of the way. So, uh, what did you want to crack on with? Uh, yeah, well, uh, we, we, think, do, we think do that, have the uh, uh, the Capita story, uh, explaining how uh, Capita uh, are basically trying to possibly get their hands on some privatisation in the uh, uh, post office and various other areas. Should, uh, because with that was to do with the um, postcode. Was the postcode connection? Uh, do you want to do that story first, or um, I could do an intro and then we could listen to the uh, uh, the uh, lock eight. Um, um, ah, whichever way you want to go. Yeah, well, we could do that. We could do that now, and then uh, then we we'll see if, uh, if that stimulates any discussion in the uh, any questions or anything. Um, all right. Well, look, um, I've done this little sort of bit of in research, and I'm going to call it the Irish postcode ripoff. Right. And uh, I'd like to start first in the UK, where 15 years of uh, post office privatisation has occurred. And you know, it's not like Irish Water, where you start a new uh, uh, sort of corporation and make that into a private corporation, or give it the the structure of a private corporation for later sale as shares uh, to Saudi interests or, or whoever. Uh, but uh, what we're seeing in the UK is when they're going for a, a, an existing institution that they would actually target um, parts of that institution. So uh, what we're seeing, for instance, a, a, a corporation called Capita, uh, which is basically pro is providing a service to the post office uh, with the companies like Fujitsu uh, in the UK. And, and uh, they're basically, so it's, so it's basically sort of the computerized end of of the, uh, the post office, which, funnily enough, is a very crucial part. Um, and of course, uh, a very crucial part of the post office, and more importantly, the part private uh, uh, sort of uh, mail deliverers, uh, like uh, UPS and uh, DHL and the like, uh, all rely in England on, uh, on, a, on a postcode system for their computer systems. Um, so they have this all set up, and these computer systems cost an absolute fortune. Um, and uh, and the, the, they help the the delivery of these these items because the uh, post office has the advantage of having local knowledge, uh, but uh, obviously anybody could turn up at your door from a private corporation. So uh, anyway, coming on to Lock Eight um, uh, and the uh, what we call the Air Code, uh, it's the Irish Postcode, the Air Code scandal. Uh, it's my my own uh, title there. Very pithy, isn't it? Um, and we've got uh, 28 uh, million was given to Capita uh, to come up with a postcode scheme, which we, we've called their code. And Lock 8 points out, and you'll hear it in the, uh, in the short uh, uh, recording, we have, uh, that uh, there, there was a free alternative. And so why wasn't it being used? 
Uh, well, you know, I think it is to bring it in line with the UK uh, in order to help and allow privatization to occur. And so air code is very important to the big corporations uh, because it fits in with their computer systems. It's as simple as that. It saves them a fortune than having to come over here and rejig uh, their systems uh, and, and their systems work worldwide. So they're very much interconnected. So uh, if we're saying why did they spend 28 million, well it was to get investment uh, and maybe take away the post office in Ireland uh, and privatise it ultimately. Probably in bits as, we, as we're talking about capita here. Um, now of course, uh, what other evidence you might say, Sean, for this uh, amazing revelation? Well, we've got uh, Uber, the uh, minicab uh, crowd, and when you go on the comments section, we've been talking about trolls paid for uh, by corporations. And uh, you will see uh, when there's an Uber story, there was always the buzz going, oh, great, I'm glad they're coming. Oh, no, that'd be affordable uh, cabbing and all this kind of stuff. So you get all this, this thing going on. Um, and and these, these guys are very slick. Uh, now, what they're doing, Uber, like, uh, like the mail uh, deliverers, um, basically really needs a postcode because they could be sending anybody to your door uh, and that person may not even be a, a, aware of that, sit that area. Um, so they really need a postcode system to slot into uh, their uh, computerized GPS and, uh, and mail systems that they use internationally. So, um, and that, they need that to take over the post office. Obviously. So, uh, but Uber are an interesting point. I mean, on the outside, Uber are having difficulties in Ireland, uh, more so than London, uh, where the Irish are, uh, are demanding that their uh, drivers have uh, the same standards as the Irish minicab drivers. Um, and so, uh, but they are also going to invest a lot of money. And what their angle is, is to get your foot in the door and then knock out the opposition, then lobby for uh, legal changes like we're seeing in the UK, and then uh, which are more friendly. And of course we've got TTIP which is also about deregulation. So there's a load of things that are connecting together and uh, this air code is actually very intrinsic to it. Uh, and so we know it's more than a waste of 28 million, it's actually investment for the investment uh, uh, people to come into Ireland and start ripping apart various aspects of uh, Irish business uh, and local Irish business at that. So um, I just thought I'd put that in and, and we had the PPS thing as well. It's worth uh, sort of uh, bearing in mind that when we have air code, we have a PPS and we have those two, uh, two items put together, that, that is a very saleable item for many corporations who want to get direct debits and various other things. Uh, so that they can uh, invest, you know, ten times as much as they're getting coming in. And we can wait for the next bust, and then we can go through the whole process of bailing them out uh, as well. So, I mean, uh, have you got anything to add to that, uh, Jimmy? Um, and uh, we could go on to the recording. Yeah, let's just go straight on to it. Okay, mate. Friends of our colleagues in the United Kingdom and how they've uh, basically worked with the postcode system there for the last 15 years. Uh, and at the moment, air members are expressing concern that the system is just not right at the moment, that there are glitches in the system which have been identified very well over the last number of days uh, in, in media. And uh, it's different about different delivering parcels, but when you're actually responsible for people's lives, there's a, a deep concern that the system is just not fit for purpose at this stage. Now, one of the things that struck me yesterday was that they, despite spending $27 million, despite all of the effort that had gone into launch it yesterday, it still didn't work with simple things like Google Maps, and it hadn't been put into sat-nav systems that would be in, in common use. I asked Alex White, the minister, when he was on the programme yesterday, is it something that the fire service and the ambulance service and the guards can use from now? Here's his response. We have worked very closely with the emergency services. I mean, this, this project has been in planning for quite a while. They are fully behind this. The National Ambulance Service is fully behind it, all of the emergency services, the fire, all of the others. So there's very, very, very close cooperation between my department, the contractor, and all of the emergency services. We've done an can, enormous can they, amount of Can outreach. they use them from today? Oh, yeah. Well, of course, they'll, they'll, they'll be able to use them. I mean, once, once they're assigned and once we have them in people's systems, they have to populate your... An, an ambulance yeah. there today, right? Say, yeah. for example, an ambulance has to come out to my house and I say yeah. I am at point whatever. 
Is there a facility within that emergency ambulance or that guard the car that will be able to pinpoint exactly yes. where I am? Yes. That technology exists today. Yes, yes, because if you have a database of air codes, a national database of air codes, you will be able to pinpoint the latitude and longitude from the air code. If you're an emergency service or you're a business or any of the other big operators will be using this system, yes. Now, he was saying yesterday the National Ambulance Service is fully behind air code. What I took from that is that there's an extra level of complication there. You give the air code, it's accessed from a database, they work out the GPS positioning and then they send that back to the ambulance. To me, and I'm not an expert, that sounds, sounds kind of complicated, Paul. Well, it absolutely is, and just to be very clear about this, Johnson, the ambulance service is not ready to go at this stage using air code. Be very clear about that. And the members so the, the, minister, the minister is wrong. The ambulance service is not using it. For uh, it is not using it because, they, first of all, the, the vehicles themselves and the control room systems uh, have not been uh, brought up to that level of technology. The system that's used at the moment, just to explain briefly to listeners, is that when a, a call comes to a command centre, uh, that address is put up onto a screen. Uh, the commander uh, and the control centre directs the ambulance to the actual scene, be that an address or be it a road traffic accident or whatever it, it, the ambulance is required. So it is directed. And at the moment, there's a discussions ongoing which will see the introduction of a system in the ambulance um, vehicle which will mirror the map that, that, that is in the actual control centre. And don't forget something, is that uh, the, the technology will be able to, will be able to use air, co air code. But right now, if we were to do that, uh, as of what happened yesterday, you would see that there are a duplication of addresses, incorrect addresses, so we couldn't, uh, air members could not actually rely on that particular piece of uh, technology. So and if, it's, if it's not being used now, Paul, mm -hmm. what do you need before you have confidence and your members will have confidence in using it? Well, first of all, this is also a public uh, confidence issue, Jonathan. Uh, we need to know that the system is glitch-free glitch free which basically means it's refined down to where the exact address for the air code actually exists in the location where it's been identified also what we need and you're after touching on that point when a member of the public calls for an ambulance to a control center is he or she going to be requ required to identify the address by the actual air code or postcode that needs to be clarified because as you know John that there has to be an education of the public we had the 999 education program the 112 and also when to call an ambulance and when not to call an ambulance and as you know uh, many elderly people around the country will be very, very concerned or, c or people caring for, for people who are ill. Do I have to have this code when I call the command yeah. and control well, centre? They, they, they're saying it's voluntary to put it on an envelope. I'm not sure if the yeah. same would apply to the emergency services. The bottom line here, Paul, just to finish up, yes. are you concerned this may cost lives if it's implemented without being thought through? Oh, absolutely. Be very clear about that, and that's why our members have had discussions with ambulance management. And in fairness to the ambulance management uh, team uh, in, in this country and the National Ambulance Service, they've made it quite clear that the, when the system is introduced, it will be introduced on the basis that it's absolutely glitch-free, that it's reliable, and that the public and the people providing the ambulance service can be absolutely confident. No, sure. Right. So what do you make of that? Well, that was uh, sort of tied in quite nicely with what I was saying about big business, it being for big business. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously I was a little bit more pointed in pointing out which big businesses would, would benefit and, uh, and how, how that would see or aid the privatisation of Ireland's, uh, Ireland's uh, sort of uh, government uh, bodies, um, which, you know, is... Uh, is the slippery slope and we can see just look over to the UK to see how that all worked out it, it wasn't very good at all we've got disabled people without benefits uh, or reductions in benefits so uh, um, and we've got a big enough problem in Ireland with that as it is um, so you know there's uh, just a whole whole series of situations so but uh, have you got any other uh, new uh, issues there well, it just seems to me one of because I because I did watch uh, the guy who was working on the postcode for quite some time before this project was tendered out to the this new crowd who have created this new system. And he's been working on the postcode for for donkey's years, and his major point of contention was that 
the system that they're planning on using here in Ireland is not it's not done in a way that's sort of like systemic uh, like like the way they have it done in England or in in Northern Ireland for example where um, postcodes are related to each other uh, geographically so but and uh, this postcode that they're planning to bring into Ireland is not done it's more done on a random sort of a sort of a basis so like uh, anybody who was um, like for example right somebody going around doing delivery in England and even if they don't know where exactly in an area or a neighborhood a particular postcode is they can figure out more or less uh, from adjacent postcodes of where they are and they can find their way using the English system but you could not apply the same ideas same principles to the displanned Irish postcode system because it because of its random nature it's just not it, well apparently this is what the man said that it, it just it's just not going to work um, so there are my thoughts now uh, on it like that as for the privatization of the uh, uh, of the of, of the governments like the government here in Ireland is private anyway, you know, it's uh, it's run by the Cor Crown Corporation, you know, and uh, <laughs> and whether lives will be lost due to uh, these postcodes, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure the postcode is going to make any difference. I think the, the reason why lives are lost at the minute, like, is because we have a bad healthcare service, we have bad ambulance, ambulance services, like, and uh, not, like, over the years, I, I just couldn't count how many different ambulance services have been closed around the country and um, ambulances are having to go so much further these days to get to locations that they don't get there on time. I don't think uh, lives will be lost due to the postcode. I think lives are being lost already due to a, 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 a too bad infrastructure, basically. You know, I don't, I don't see how a postcode is going to improve it. You know, I really don't. It's not the problem. The problem is not finding the places. The problem is enough ambulances to cover some of the more remote areas of the country and that's the problem <laughs> for the ambulances I reckon you know personally um, I, personally I couldn't care less they can bring in whatever codes they like and um, whether I'll choose to use it or not will be another matter you know maybe I'll use it for some things maybe I might need it to get things delivered uh, maybe not who knows <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's. But I have been hearing well, some. Well, I have been hearing yeah. some things though about like this postcode being connected to people's addresses and it being used in some way to um, connect people up for property taxes, for water charges, and the like. So, I think for one, I'm going to be wary before I go contracting to use the postcode. Personally, I don't mind. No, it I can think bring people it need to be a bit wary anyway, because anybody can turn up at your door with, uh, with the use of a postcode. You know, um, it's uh, it, you know, and we're talking about Uber here. You know, yeah, uh, anybody could turn up at your door anyway. You know, it's not like any everybody just everybody's findable. Whether you got a postcode or not, you know, <laughs> you know, well, every, yeah. most people will have a, an address that they use and can be found at. You know, so you can be found through your address just as easily. You know. Sure. Well, I was thinking more about the Uber uh, users that would be using a postcode. Uh, they would have to use a postcode uh, to, for their system to operate. Mm. So, uh, but at the moment, you know, we're getting people that are employed by the government, uh, probably got police checks, uh, taxi drivers that have police checks, and uh, uh, and of course the tax. Um, the tax basically is uh, going off the shore. You know, it's, it's not being paid in Ireland, and it won't be. So. Uh, we'll be losing the tax revenue from uh, local minicab businesses and uh, we'll be losing it to international corporations that uh, aren't going to pay that level of tax. So. But, you know, our taxes already leave the country. You know, whether this postcode comes in or not, our taxes still go to the Consolidated Fund, which sure. goes out of the country and it goes to the Crown Corporation. It's, you know... Uh, our taxes never stayed here in this country. It's <laughs> it's just a sad <laughs> fact, you know. I don't, you know, so I don't think I don't think. Get all think, political on me now, will you? <laughs> hey, get all political on me now. Well, so. not really. I'm just I'm, I'm just tying in like what we already know about the tax system, like from from the research that's been done here on site and by lots of hosts and 
you know, has been pointed out on many occasions, uh, and it's in the statute books, it can be researched, uh, the consolidated fund, and uh, it, it's, it's old legislation, and it, it wasn't part of all the old legislation that was removed quite recently, I think 4,000 or plus old statutes which have been removed from those statute books because they're just outdated, but the consolidated fund apparently is still in there. Now, all Irish taxes get paid into this consolidated fund, which we know gets goes out and goes to fund these wars around the world to, to drop bombs on Iraqi children to drop bombs on Palestinian kids and wherever wherever the war effort is going you know and that's where our taxes go and there's very little of that goes stays in the country for the benefit of the people sure sure um, I would uh, give a heads up uh, to Ken Donnelly who added six new photos on his Facebook um, and he said that Stephen Bennett, after two months on remand, has been released uh, for peacefully protesting uh, against Irish, wa pro uh, Irish water. Um, just a little heads up there, a uh, little change of uh, note. Yeah, I spotted that, all right. Yeah, good to see you about. Uh, how long was he inside again? I can't remember. Uh, uh, it was, uh, two, oh, sorry, I just A couple it. of months, was it? <laughs> it was two, two months. He yeah. spent eight weeks on yeah. remand. Right. Um... Any indication of, of was he get, did he get held in contempt or, or or what was it that it was contempt of court wasn't it for because he wouldn't comply with a judge's order basically to, uh, to, I think the judge was more or less asking him uh, giving him a mandate like you'll either stop protesting or you're going to be going to jail like and he wouldn't he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't give into that wouldn't make that undertaking basically so I think basically he got done for contempt of court if I remember correct. It's a, bit, it's a bit odd for an article to say that you can't do something that's democratic, you know, it's kind of... Well, yeah, well, we did, how many times have we seen this over the last, uh, ever since the Irish water protests, it's not the first case, and I don't think it will be the last, like, uh, you know, the, the, but um, I think we have to stick by what the Constitution says now, you know, a lot of people say that we have the right to protest, and... Uh, and it's written into the Constitution, well that's not quite true because the Constitution doesn't say you have the right to protest but you have a right to peaceful assembly yeah. you know as, as and it, you know as long as you are don't uh, make any morally questionable sort of like uh, speech or or actions or you don't bear arms you, you are free to peacefully assemble to your heart's content so um, you know I think uh, Protesters have to remember that you do not have the right to protest, but you have the right to peacefully assemble, as is written in the Constitution. I can't remember the article. Actually, I did have a little bit of a... Uh, I can't remember. Do I have it here? On the right, because I did. I pulled up an interesting article there earlier on today about our rights as, uh, say, citizens. So, <laughs> Well, I do find the, uh, the term citizen a little bit questionable, but... Um, where was this? Yeah, your rights and how to deal with the Gardaí, basically. Now, this was uh, this was coming out of a site called uh, indymedia.ie. Now, um, the, a, a new era in October 2006 and, and continues now with the practical ongoing training and conditioning of hundreds of Gardaí at Bell and Boy uh, to, to the use of violence over rule of law. Now, they're talking about fundamental rights here, and uh, they basically give a little list of, of fundamental rights. Um, so, Article 40.3.1 says, The state guarantees in its laws to respect, as far as practicable, by its laws to defend and vindicate the personal rights of the citizen. Now, Article 40.4 4.1 says that no citizen, citizen shall be deprived of, of his personal liberty save in accordance with law. Article 40.5 says that the dwelling of every citizen is inviolable and shall not be forcibly entered save in accordance with law. Article 40.6 says the state guarantees liberty for the exercise of the following rights subject to public order and morality. Now, number one. The right of the citizen to express freely their convictions and opinions, and the education uh, and, and the education of public opinion, and two, the right of citizens to assemble peacefully and without arms, subject to public order quoted above, 
uh, in Article 6 gives gives us a clue as to which act the Gardaí most commonly use with regard to protesting. Uh, one of them is the Criminal Justice uh, Public Order Act 1994 and the other is the Road Traffic Act, curiously enough. So, <laughs> but there we go. Um, uh, the, the, you have the right to peacefully assemble, basically, uh, and not well, while not bearing arms. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, it's uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on there, and but but the, the uh, there's another story actually that came out which was quite interesting. I thought um, concerning Ireland, and uh, there was a, a story that's come out in the Cancer.ie Irish Cancer uh, Association. So they basically, on July, it was July the 16th they brought this out, but uh, uh, they were saying that the EU and US trade deal was likely to affect Ireland's ability to pass public health laws. Um, and I'll just read a couple of paragraphs on that very quickly. Uh, we believe that the public health legislation in Ireland is under serious threat unless a planned trade agreement between the European Union and the United States is significantly altered. The Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP, is a planned trade agreement currently being negotiated by officials from the United States and the EU, which aims to reduce regulation and stimulate economic growth, uh, for someone anyway. It could allow multinational companies to sue countries for introducing public health policies and will reduce the cancer rate and save lives, but hit the commercial bottom line. Uh, that, that hit the uh, com uh, commercial bottom line. And it is through similar trade agreements that Australia, the first country to introduce plain packaging of tobacco, is being sued by the tobacco companies. So uh, obviously, there's a very good story there. They do go into what uh, go into it. It's the Irish Cancer Society, and uh, you know, basically, uh, the, you go to the content, and it's you know, the title is uh, EU US trade deal likely to affect Ireland's ability to pass public health laws. Um, and you know that's kind of a one that might have slipped people by, um, and it's a very uh, hot topic in Ireland. So um, we've obviously got issues with uh, public and uh, private uh, Irish uh, medical uh, sort of services available or not available to people over here. Uh, it certainly um, used to be a lot better in the UK. I don't know if we're heading more towards the Irish version, where many people go without health. Uh, health support or uh, dental support or whatever uh, because of the cost um, but uh, anyway that's that's just uh, another one that comes in and that would see any sort of public uh, sort of health uh, for people in need disabilities and what have you uh, could be uh, actually attacked uh, by these uh, type of agreements and uh, we're certainly keeping an eye on uh, Ming Flanagan who's in uh, Europe at the moment and trying to fight against uh, the TTIP agreement, uh, uh, I think, in its entirety. Uh, some people would like to see some of it brought in, uh, but um, you know, it's uh, it's possibly a slippery slope. Uh, but uh, anyway, we have uh, reported on it, and the cancer Irish Cancer Society are certainly a little bit concerned. Uh, over to you, Jimmy. Oh, right. Uh, so I suppose a question. Why is Ireland being signed up as a testing ground for weapons technology? Now, I think during the week there, Minister Simon Coveney uh, said something uh, that seemed uh, the complete opposite. Uh, he spoke of, uh, of plans to make Ireland a testing zone for advanced military and weapons guidance systems, including drones and submarine drones and other such high-tech hardware. Now, one of the proposals he has brought uh, to Cabinet, uh, the, the international defence industry, uh, is to have increased access to Irish Defence Forces for product testing. Uh, apparently, the Minister had been working on a white paper setting out his aims. Uh, he went on to say, we are planning to do a lot more of this, he said, in a rather expansive mode, to link defence infrastructure to the skill set of the Defence Forces with innovators uh, in the private sector so that actually we can create products that are good for defence. Also, we can potentially develop products that can be put to good use in the market for the private sector as well. Now, Coveney said the plans wouldn't uh, involve the testing of actual weapons like guns or rocket launchers, but what is the difference between a missile guidance system and a missile? Uh, this is likely saying 
we only make the gun or the sun or the sun sights, but we don't make the bullets. It's all military hardware after all, he said, and uh, especially these days when so much of the military warfare has become high tech uh, and uh, and remote, although the consequences are far from remote for the victims. So um, he enthusiastically described a company which is designing unmanned aircraft or drone technology to actually uh, to actually use off the deck of ships, basically, uh, to be able to observe what fishing boats are doing. Uh, he then added in a sentence that must uh, sound alarm bells that this type of uh, unmanned drone is also being used in the army in terms of securing targets. Uh, securing targets uh, like the weapons that pick out Al-Qaeda militants uh, which have been killed uh, out abroad there. So Minister Coveney appears is very excited about all this and thinks it does not compromise Ireland's long-standing neutrality and a strong aversion to participating in the arms industry. However, despite this principal stand which is uh, which actually reminds us of, um, reminds us uh, he goes on to talk about the advanced uh, software industry and the e exciting possibilities that the that these new military developments offer. Now you can well, find that article absolutely. over at amondelaney.wordpress.com. Uh, it's quite it, there's a, there's a lot to it, so there's a lot more to read in it. I just picked out some of the yeah, main I mean, points. Sto there's a story just come out about private contractors are actually making decisions on who the enemies are and not. Uh, uh, who are operating these drones, private contractors. So yeah, it's not yeah. even military people that are making decisions on who's going to die or live. No. Uh, it's actually private contractors, uh, very much like Edward Snowden was. So Booz Allen is actually one of the companies uh, who does that type of uh, work. Um, and if you listen to uh, his uh, documentaries done by uh, uh, Laura Poitras, uh, they'll certainly explain uh, the sort of technologies they have. But uh, so, a report has come out and said, enough is enough. So on that note now Sean we've got 40 seconds left so I'm going to take this opportunity to thank everybody in the chat box, uh, cheers for tuning in to Eddie, it was a great full crowd there, great to see, don't forget the donate button we've got OIM not up next and I'm going to bid you farewell Sean over to you Alright and uh, thank you all very much and uh, big heads up to all the Shell uh, uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of protesters in Ireland and, uh, and abroad uh, they've, uh, Shell has had a 2.3 billion drop in profits this, uh, uh, this sort of uh, last quarter and uh, let's see it uh, drop further. Só dinheiro, você diz que